Good morning, distinguished delegates, dear colleagues, participants following us online or joining us here from our multi-level action pavilion at COP26. And welcome to the session 100% Renewables, Driving the Inclusive Renewable Energy Transition. My name is Georgia Rambelli, and I'm the coordinator for climate policy and energy governance at the European Secretariat of ICLE, Local Government for Sustainability. And it would be my great pleasure to be your moderator for this discussion today. The session of today is organized by ICLE Local Governments of Sustainability with the support of 100% renewable cities and region networks and with the collaboration of the EU funded project CESA, Accelerating Energy Solutions in Africa. It is increasingly clear that the transition to a sustainable, fair and resilient energy system is key in order to accelerate the implementation of the Paris Agreement. And within this transition, uh, we need, of course, to provide a great role and key crucial step in increasing the renewable energy rollout. It's an ingredient that we need to win our race to meet our climate neutrality targets. So cities are home to about uh, uh, more than half of the population and they, globally, and they account for about 75% of the global farm and energy consumption. They are key for this reason to the energy transition and to its implementation. As the closest level to the citizens, they are not only acting as administrator, but they also lead by example through the daily policies and the way that they, for example, conduct public purchasing, but also they provide a wide array of services to their citizens. So because of these different roles, cities are a critical juncture right now to leverage this momentum to reduce energy demand and to further develop and to further scale up more sustainable energy solution. These include, of course, acting benefiting from renewable energy sources, which is what we want to focus on today within their territories, but also to think a little bit about how to develop plans and to reinvest the benefits of these renewable energy sources and the revenues that come with them right within the communities that they serve. So although this potential is indeed widely understood, all over the world, renewable energy is accelerating, in particular in the power sector, but is still lagging behind in the heating, cooling and transport sector, where the share of renewables, unfortunately, still remains relatively low. So these sectors in particular are in need to provide and to and to implement more sustainable local solution in order to scale up renewable, in order to curb energy use, but also to cut uh, the related greenhouse gas emissions. So cities are uniquely positioned to roll this out and to drive this change, building on the roles that I just mentioned a few minutes ago. But they are also aware of the role that they have to play. And as such, they have been spearheading the process all over the world. They have been setting bold commitments and targets. They have been looking into net zero targets. They have looking into becoming 100% renewables while creating at the same time healthier, more livable urban environments and transforming their communities with renewable energy. So today we will discuss the future of the energy uh, generation and consumption. Our speakers and panelists will discuss with us the needed steps towards the achievement of 100% renewable energy targets globally, and the support that the involvement of the community and local government can really proactively provide in reaching and ensuring a more resilient, fair, and low carbon energy transition. So we will exchange on a couple of key questions. We will talk about what is the role of the energy transition in achieving the goal of the Paris Agreement and how does the establishment and rollout of community initiatives support this transition? How can local government transitioning to 100% renewable can help address the current climate emergency and support the national government in achieving the targets that we are setting for ourselves? And then finally, what are the steps needed to implement an inclusive and adjust energy transition that can ensure technical and socioeconomic resilience of our energy system? So before we start with our conversation, I would like already from now to invite all participants here in the room, as well as the ones that are following us online, to join the discussion by posting your question and your comments using our slido.com. So you can see on our screen right now a QR code as well as a, a password that you can insert in slido.com and you can interact with us by using these specifically channels. 
So I mentioned already that I will be joined in this conversation by an excellent lineup of speakers. So we have a number of speakers that will provide in some pitch, some food for thought to get us started in our rounds of discussion. So it's my pleasure to introduce to you Michael Renner, he's a program officer uh, for policy in the International Renewable Energy Agency. Irina is joining us online. Hello, Michael. Hello, I'm also joined by Roy Tsen, also joining us online. He's the head of climate and energy action and the ICLE World Secretariat. And then finally here in person with me, Rana Adib. She's the executive secretary of REN21. Thank you for being with us, Rana. It's wonderful to have you here. They will have the task to set up our discussion, but we will have a number of local government representatives. They will be sharing instead their thoughts, their reaction, their ideas, and their experiences on how this transition that we are talking about will actually be implemented on the ground. So I have with me David Tudji, Tudji, apologies, is the development manager of the Bristol Energy Network of the city of Bristol. Thank you for being with us, David. I also have here with me Chris Castro, is the director of the Office of Sustainability and Resilience of the city of Orlando from the US. And then finally, joining us online, last but absolutely not the least, we have Joseph Oganga, is the chief officer department of energy and decentralization of the Kizumo County from Kenya. Hello, hello Joseph and welcome. Thank you for being you. with us. Thank you. So, since I promised that we wanted to engage you, engage all of you already from the very beginning in our conversation, I would like to remind you, of course, that you can join us and share your comments via our Slido. And I would like to kick off a little exercise and ask you all to respond to the question, what is required to reach 100% renewable energy as a stepping stone to achieve net zero emission by 2050? We will be collecting your thoughts via Slido and towards our conversation, we will see a beautiful work cloud popping up behind us to give us some feeling for also what is the temperature both in the room and online concerning the future of renewable energy, of course, in our goals to, towards 2050. So start thinking, start filling in, uh, of course, our, our work cloud with your thoughts. And now I would like to give the floor to our first speaker to get us started with our first round of discussion. So Michael, it's your turn now to, to, to give us some food for thought, of course, and to begin our conversation around the role of renewable energy in reaching our targets and our Paris Agreement. So the floor is yours, Michael. Thank you so much, Georgia, for the introduction. It's really great to be on, on this panel. I really look forward to the, to the whole discussion. So I think it's quite clear that the transition to an energy system built on renewable energy and greater energy efficiency is absolutely central to achieving the goals of the Paris Agreement, which really is to say that we need to avoid climate chaos ultimately and the economic upheaval that it would actually bring with it. Um, you know, my sense, and I think the sense of a lot of people, is that the international negotiations uh, around climate and energy matters are often really still marked by a perception that the needed action is principally about sort of costs and burdens and how to share them and how maybe how to avoid them. So I think we need to do you know, a better job, I think, maybe than we have done so far in ensuring that both climate and energy politics coalesces around the socioeconomic benefits to really assure broad acceptance and broad support for the needed accelerated change that's really ahead of us in the coming years and decades. Uh, next, uh, or first uh, substantive slide, please. Thank you. Um, so our work at the International Renewable Energy Agency demonstrates that the expansion of renewables can go hand in hand with a variety, with a diverse range of socioeconomic benefits, including very much job creation. In our latest report that we just released, actually, we find that in 2020, there were about 12 million jobs in the renewable energy sector worldwide. And that number has grown from a little more than 7 million in 2012. So we see really steady, uh, steady growth, steady improvement in that regard. Now, our modeling work further suggests that a pathway to keep global warming to no more than 1.5 degrees Celsius can further expand these jobs to about 43 million by 2050. This would actually be 5 million jobs more than under a, another scenario that is based on the current NDCs. Now, the more ambitious pathway requires investments of about $4.4 trillion per year. And just by a matter of comparison, comparing it, that would add about $1.1 trillion annually over what is implied under the NDC pledges that we have now in place. So about a bit more than a quarter of this investment needs to go to renewables. About a third needs to go to energy efficiency. 
And then a fairly large portion of the remainder, about 22%, would go to related infrastructure and to electrification measures. Next uh, slide, please. Investing in a Paris compliant energy transition would also yield other benefits. So for example, in the period from now until 2050, uh, global GDP would be substantially higher than under the current NDC pledges. Uh, Front-loaded investments would bring the biggest boost in the next few years. Now, moreover, or perhaps more, more importantly, in a sense, the energy transition also improves human welfare. IRENA uses a complex welfare index to measure outcomes under its two transition scenarios. Uh, welfare improves under, over time in both of these scenarios, but more so under the, the ambitious one, the 1.5 uh, degree Celsius scenario. The difference between the two scenarios is mostly due to gains resulting from heightened energy access and from reduced air pollution, therefore very, very major uh, health benefits. Next uh, slide. So to bring about these positive socioeconomic outcomes, it is really quite important that governments undertake a, a range of policies. Uh, first, to continue, of course, to support deployment and integration of renewables into the, into the grid and other energy systems, prioritizing the development of a diverse and inclusive workforce, paying very close attention to skills, training needs, and the job quality issues, embracing industrial policies to strengthen local value chains, uh, and in doing so, guarding against uh, various potential misalignments in labor markets, these could be of a temporal, a spatial, or an occupational nature. And we all realize that the energy transition is not all going to be very smooth, right? There will be some bumps along the road. And so I think we need to equally uh, be aware that we need to place, um, that we need to adopt very strong social protection measures for the communities and the works that are now dependent on fossil fuels and to really help them to make this transition along with everybody else. Now, all of these measures together, I think, need to be seen as part and parcel of a very broad, a holistic policy framework. And you know, much of what we address at IRENA, of course, uh, is directed at the level of national government policy. But it's quite clear that what we need is very much stepped up collaboration among both national level governments and local authorities. Next uh, slide, please. So one of the things that we are doing is under the ARENA Coalition for Action, we have a working group that has focused on community energy uh, as, as one of its major work streams. The Coalition for Action is a global multi-stakeholder platform convening more than 125 renewable energy actors from the private sector, from civil society, and from among international organizations. Findings from a coalition white paper on broadening the ownership of renewables highlight that community energy has great potential to support a just and inclusive energy transition. Among the positive impacts are the following, adding local socioeconomic value through investment, job creation, and improved welfare, improving energy security through lower energy costs, widening access to renewables through citizen-driven innovation, broadening participation in the energy system and expanding the awareness and acceptance of renewables. Now, what we need really to help this along further is a conducive enabling framework that will allow community energies and tap potential to benefit more and more citizens and communities. And what this includes among other things is a supportive you know, set of legislation and government policies to facilitate the development of community energy projects and policy design that is tailored to provide much better support for community energy investment. With a broad integrated approach and by ensuring that workers and communities locally have a seat at the table, a successful and a just energy transition is possible. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Michael, for getting us started with all this food for thought. I think you already put your finger on a couple of items that I'm fairly sure will come back recurring to our discussion. This idea of the importance of enabling uh, framework, I think it will be crucial and essential during our conversation in particular, when we are talking about how local government can really roll out their full potential when it comes to implementation, but also what you mentioned about the importance and the impact that the energy transition can have in terms of welfare, these indicators that you that you, you showed us how they can signal really the change of quality of life for our citizens and the number of jobs that go with it. I think this is very important to also, of course, always have at the back of our mind. And I wonder if our colleagues here on the panel that are from cities 
have had similar considerations when they were started to plan and think about the renewable energy transition on the ground in their own cities. So Chris, maybe I would like to start with you and hear a little bit your thoughts and how do you see the contribution of renewable energy in your local policy and maybe in our wider objectives and agreements? Thank you so much. Um, so in Orlando, we have been working on this transition to 100% renewables. And um, we've made a commitment that by 2030, our city operations would be powered uh, by 100% renewables. And by 2050, the entire city, every theme park, every hotel, every resident. And obviously that's a pretty bold commitment. Orlando is lucky to have a municipal utility. It's vertically integrated with power gen, transmission distribution. And so we have a little bit of control where our mayor serves as a permanent seat on the commission and our city council helps vote in individuals uh, to represent our residents. So it gives us uh, a, a unique opportunity to begin influencing community energy as Michael was talking about. Um, you know, we have joined uh, a number of cities to begin identifying some high impact areas for us to really deepen our carbon drawdown. And, and Michael uh, addressed a couple of these that are directly aligned. One is reducing building energy use and energy efficiency being uh, a, a high priority. Secondly, the, the decarbonization of our electric grid, increasing renewables. And thirdly, electrification of, of everything, buildings, vehicles, transit, you name it. Uh, and we also have seen that uh, in, in mapping this out earlier this year, our utility, our municipal utility came out with an integrated resources plan, looking at the year 2050 and how to actually achieve zero. And out of that plan identified a, a number of very interesting findings. One is that in order to get there, we must early retire the existing coal fire generation that we have powering Orlando. Uh, uh, and so we've made that commitment that by 2027, at the latest, uh, we will be ending coal fire generation in the city, uh, transitioning to renewables and, and gas in the short term, uh, and, and really looking at very creative ways to also meet demand side management through things like virtual power plants, right? The ability to control connected loads uh, uh, in our homes and in our buildings to help manage our grid in a more, uh, in a more effective way. And lastly, on this uh, notion of community energy, we have been identifying that uh, in Florida, the regulatory model for electricity is, is quite antiquated. Uh, it's, it does not lend itself to the proliferation of renewables. Specifically, we've outlawed third-party power purchase agreements, which is how the vast majority of renewable energy is installed globally. Uh, and so what we've started to do in the city is say, well, if we can't enable PPAs, what if we can help create these solar cooperatives where homeowners who are interested in investing in rooftop solar could join uh, a co-op and go through a kind of a tailored handholding process to identify the potential for rooftop solar, to identify the proper contractors that are vetted, licensed, bonded, insured, and, and then through economies of scale, help achieve better price points for each one of these co-op members. Coupling that with financing that provides 100% finance up front and be able to find these you know, savings to investment ratios that, that are cash flow positive from day one. Uh, so those are um, you know, briefly a couple of different things that we have going on in Orlando that are, that are focused around how to enable more community energy. That phone service. It's a bit cumbersome, apologies. So, but thank you very much for bringing forward the plans uh, that Orlando is already trying to implement and to roll out and also looking into how to fix some of these hurdles that unfortunately I'm sure most cities are facing when it comes to really looking into the regulatory system that can support these more innovative and extended models that can in include their communities. And speaking of that, I would like to understand a little bit also what is the experience in Bristol? Did you have similar challenges? And I'm sure the, you, you, what was the role of the political commitment even behind the support of this type of initiative? We heard from Orlando, but it would be interesting also to hear what is your experience David? Yeah hi I, I'm from Bristol Energy Network and um, we've been around since 2010 and since that time I might just take, take these off yeah, while should, I talk yeah. <laughs> yeah since that time um, we we basically formed because um, the Climate Change Act was made in 2008 and it uh, meant that we weren't just 
persuading people about climate change and more it's about what do we actually do about that and so working in my own community i founded eastern energy group and then bristol energy network to bring together the 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 resource of of the city uh which is uh, the expertise of the city in, in a voluntary capacity uh, and in doing so we've brought forward amazing projects like this uh wind turbine this is a scale model of the one that's going to be built uh next year 4.2 megawatt turbine that's going to be built in one of the poorest communities in bristol and it's been uh, it's it's this community that's asked for this turbine and develop this turbine with the skills and expertise of Bristol Energy Network and its membership. So if you resource communities with uh, facilitators such as Bristol Energy Network, that then you can actually deliver at scale. So the city uh, declared a, a climate emergency in 2018, the first city in the world to do so. Uh, and then in 2019, um, uh, 20, yeah, we, we then went on to declare that we would actually be a net zero, net zero city by 2030. So that net zero city is not just the council's infrastructure, that's the whole city, because the council set its own target for 2025. And we're well on the way to doing that through community energy. Uh, this project uh, will provide um, uh, 10,000 um, uh, megawatt hours a year um, and, and will supply to 3,000, uh, equivalent 3,500 homes, but that's just one project. We've got 4.2 megawatt solar owned by Bristol Energy Cooperative, one of our members. Um, and it's not just about um, renewable energy because renewable energy um, is part of net zero. Um, uh, yeah, sorry, could you hold that? Yeah, but uh, actually it's much more about that um, value chain that was discussed earlier, because if we decarbonize heat with electricity or with, uh, we need to reduce the heat demand in the building. So it's about energy efficiency. And in order to do that, we actually need to do the training of the skills. So we've actually identified working with 22 universities, the skills for net zero, and that's the conference we're gonna be holding next year is uh, skills for net zero and creating the, um, the uh, career pathways for people. So part of this project, which has been requested by the community itself, the fuel poor community, uh, they've actually created a community plan where they've actually mm. wanted and asked for a, um, an energy learning zone. So we're going to be working with the local universities to bring the university to that community. And I think this can be done now. We've seen that we've had COVID-19, we've seen how we can learn what work remotely, but we can also put things into local communities. So it's really about um, creating communities at, for something, not against something. And I think if you exclude communities, you'll get resistance to net zero. And that's why it's crucially important that we actually resource communities and work through those communities from the grassroots. So top down needs to actually give the resources to bottom up. And if we get the, um, uh, the top down actually resourcing, which unfortunately our UK government isn't at the moment, it's got the words in there, but there's no resource behind that. And that's why we, we really want to see our own treasury in the UK actually fund um, what community energy is doing. But we will, you know, as community energy, we will um, we will lead and 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 as we, and work. We've got a collaboration agreement with Bristol City Council to develop these projects, to utilise their land, and to work with their offices. So we will lead, and the country can follow. Cities and regions can follow. So, so I think this is why the C40 is very important. If we, if cities where national governments aren't going to commit to 1.5 in in a in a in, a, in, a, in an actual way that you know we've heard the promises, but they need to deliver the promises they've already made. 100 billion was promised last time around, it should have come around last up this time. So the loss and damage of cities around the world that don't have the resources that we have, uh, and they need to uh, honor those promises, but we will lead uh, and city, uh, where cities and regions can lead and countries can follow. I think that's the way it's gonna to have to go. So that's my own thoughts anyway. <laughs> Thank you very much, David, for the overview of what Bristol is doing at the moment and how he's also working as a council with all of the stakeholders, one of which you are representing here today. I think it's really interesting to see how you were showing how the commitment of, of Bristol becoming 20, carbon neutral by uh, 2030. And you were saying this is not just the council infrastructure. This is the entirety of the cities that the community is pledging together to achieve this objective and this target. And I think the community energy does provide you also as a outlet to make sure that the community is engaged directly in practice into implementing that vision very very quick yeah it's also the it's also the innovation uh, that the community brings we, we're bringing ppas we're bringing forward the innovation to the city not the city bringing the innovation to us so it's really uh, and also the thermal imaging technology to measure heat loss in homes 
that innovation is happening in communities because that exists within the city. So empower your communities and amazing things will happen. That's a very positive message. Thank you very much. And to hear more about how communities are being empowered all over the world, and in particular, how local governments are picking up on this innovation and also contributing directly, creating this innovation uh, to, to lead this 100%, let's say, renewable energy revolution, I would like to call it like that today. Um, I, I have my colleague, Roy Zen, uh, joining us online, who will tell us a little bit about how this process is helping us tackling the climate emergency and reaching and achieving our net zero targets. Hi, Roy, the floor is yours. Hi, Georgia. Thank you very much. Um, and good day, good morning to you all. Um, we all know that we are facing this climate crisis emergency uh, as of now, and this is the uh, decade of action. Uh, what I want to do and pitch here today is pin renewable energy or 100% renewable energy as the center point or the cornerstone. Can we go to the next slide, please? Where we cannot deny that renewable energy is is something that you would use to decarbonize your energy systems. Re renewable energy is enhancing your climate resilience, giving you access to energy and reducing energy poverty. Apart from that, giving you energy security and independence um, at the local level as well as at the national level. But nevertheless, all the initiatives, the SDGs 7, 11 and 13, NDCs uh, talking about net zero emissions target, climate neutrality target, everything, you cannot deny that renewable energy, 100% renewable energy is the cornerstone or the central pillar based on which you would be achieving these things. We have already 49 odd nations which have committed to become net zero um, by a certain year. Um, we have 40 other uh, nations already contemplating and planning on committing. And therefore I, need, I want to pitch here that nations will reach such ambitious overarching targets only bottom up with local and regional government cities achieving 100% renewables and enhancing such efforts towards climate and energy action and achieving these targets. Next slide, please. We see that local governments are driving the energy transition from the forefront. We know that um, they have a unique position and authorities which they can use to drive this transition. They can set local targets. They can work on um, how we heat and cool our buildings. They can see how the energy efficiency and con uh, conservation uh, mandates are being made. They can change their own operations to uh, renewable energy based operations. They can support other actors, including national governments and uh, spur these innovative approaches and scale up their implementation. There are many drivers among which, which uh, we have the clean energy and resilience. Uh, we have enhanced climate action, green jobs, uh, local jobs that Michael mentioned, um, overall reducing the air pollution, uh, impacting the health in a positive way, as well as creating national and international corporations and uh, generating local revenue, which will uh, also boost uh, the economy of uh, the local region or the city. Next slide, please. I have now messages recorded by representatives from various uh, cities and regions who are further um, proving that how 100% renewable energy has helped them from uh, putting up targets for uh, net zero emissions to energy access to even just an equitable transition. So I have Madam Deputy Mayor, Governor, uh, Deputy Governor from Mesnu Satengara. I have Mr. Joseph Oganga from Kisumu County, Kenya, who is also present with us uh, in the panel. And I have uh, the Mayor of Avalaneda from Argentina, who have these uh, mess sent these messages for us to know what they are doing and how they uh, find 100% renewables within their uh, overarching targets. Can we have the videos, please? Hello, my name is Siti Rohmi Jalila, the Deputy Governor of West Nusa Tenggara, Indonesia. The energy sector, which consists of electricity generations and transportation sectors, are the second highest greenhouse gas emitters in West Nusa Tenggara. In accordance of our vision of developing eco-based tourism, West Nusa Tenggara aims to reach NTB net zero emission by 2050. This commitment is reflected in the roadmap of 100% renewable energy by 2050, 
in which we are assisted by ICLEI to make it. The roadmap is intended to guide the provincial government during the energy transition and to contribute to other climate goals such as NGCs, SDGs, and climate neutrality. Contributing positively to increase the share of renewable energy in all sectors in addition to other efforts that have been made such as developing mini or micro hydro projects and photovoltaics for electricity generation, introducing electric vehicles to reduce the use of fossil fuel as well as biogas to reduce waste and in the same time providing clean energy for community in rural areas. Thank you. My name is Joseph Oganga, Chief Officer, Department of Energy and Industrialization, the County Government of Kisumu in Kenya. In Kisumu, we are working with ICLE 100% Renewable Energy and the vision for Kisumu is to achieve universal access to renewable energy for sustainable development in Kisumu County by the year 2050. Working with ICLE has helped the county government of Kisumu to achieve certain important goals like one, nationally determined goals, two, sustainable development goals, especially SDG number seven, and three, climate neutrality. By working with ICLE, we have achieved a lot as a county. One, the ICLE project has helped the county government to fulfill its mandate as provided by the Energy Act number 2019 particularly in preparation of county energy plan, which is a core mandate of the county government as provided for in the Act. Planificar Avellaneda al 2050 nos permite consolidarnos como una ciudad modelo a través del desarrollo innovador y sostenible. Lograr el 100% de nuestro consumo energético a través de energía renovable también nos permitirá diversificar la producción, generar empleo genuino en un esquema de economía circular. Esta visión fue construida a través de talleres de trabajo con la participación de empresas, de instituciones, de ONG y validados por la sociedad civil. Allí también se establecieron los principios y los valores necesarios para poder alcanzar los objetivos. El proyecto 100% Energía Renovable, financiado a través de la iniciativa IKI del gobierno alemán y llevado a cabo por ICLEI, es fundamental para generar esa hoja de ruta necesaria para construir la matriz energética que en definitiva nos va a llevar a alcanzar los objetivos y construir esa ciudad modelo que todos soñamos. En este sentido, los gobiernos locales son actores fundamentales para poder instrumentar las medidas de adaptación y de mitigación necesarias para alcanzar con los objetivos y las metas nacionales e internacionales. En esta COP26 hay que generar sí o sí un mayor compromiso colectivo que nos permita lograr llegar a esos objetivos de reducción de gases de efecto invernadero. La emergencia climática no puede esperar más. Este proyecto 100% renovable nos está indicando que llegar al 100% de consumo energético a través de renovables es posible. Debemos explorar las oportunidades que cada territorio tiene, elaborar los proyectos que sean financiables y aprovechar integralmente los recursos disponibles para lograrlo. Thank you very much, Rohit, and thank you also to all, of course, the, the colleagues that have been sharing with us their very encouraging messages on how they plan to reach their own 100% renewable targets. And also thank you to David for putting out his own personal energy to, be, <laughs> to allow us to see the subtitles on the screen. I will move a little bit closer to Chris then so that we can be all more cozy. Um, 
So since we have the opportunity to have Joseph on the line, I would like maybe to ask him following his statement to tell us a little bit more about uh, this 100% renewable commitment that Kimusu County has made and to tell us a little bit more about why they decided, for example, to go into this direction and what is the role that they feel the local government can really play into this process. So Joseph, can you share with us some thoughts? Okay. I'm afraid that we might have had a disconnection. Probably Joseph will be able to join us very soon, hopefully, and tell us a little bit more about what Kizumo counties is doing. But it's great that we had a small video at least to hear their perspective. Maybe Chris, I want to ask you then uh, a little bit of a comment on uh, on what you just heard. I think especially the last comment from the colleagues from uh, from Latin America was very comprehensive and very motivating in seeing how you know we need to go further. It's possible. We should really invest in this, developing bankable projects, I thought it was very encouraging to see how this is the direction that we want to take. What is your take uh, from, from Miami on this specific point of reaching this objective? Well, I'll, I'll say that it, it was inspiring. And I think that one of the greatest opportunities of the 21st century uh, from a job creation, from a wealth building standpoint is to transition, right? From the energy that built our world to the energy that's gonna shape our future. And that's ultimately what we've been trying to do. Um, it's really inspiring. Orlando is part of a, a several networks of cities, including Ickley, where we are trying to collaborate and, and identify what are, the, what are the capital and financing programs? What are the policies and regulations that we can implement? Uh, what are the technologies that we need to begin to invest in and further? And, and how do we identify partnerships and collaborations across the board, not just with government, but with academia, with civil society, uh, and with the business sector? Uh, you know, we have um, begun to really look into a couple of innovations that we feel have a breakthrough potential. And one of those is looking at, as we transition to 100% to renewables, Florida in particular is a bit vulnerable because we are not con connected as, as much as the rest of the contiguous United States in the ability for us to wheel power from other regions, right? We know that renewables are very geographic in terms of their potential. And Florida being this peninsula uh, only has about 3,800 megawatts of transmission capabilities. And our main renewable energy resource, as you can imagine, is solar. Uh, and so we are trying to identify what are the technologies that we need to couple with renewable, with solar, in order to, to really move into a direction uh, that is 100% renewables, but that it's affordable, that's reliable, that's resilient, and that's sustainable. And, and uh, one of the exciting research projects we're doing right now is a green hydrogen project uh, using floating solar, or what we call photovoltaics, uh, to power a, an electrolyzer that's creating hydrogen by splitting water, storing that hydrogen, and then using a fuel cell to help true up the generation of that, uh, of that renewable system so that the utility sees it as a dispatchable and reliable resource. Right? We know that there's intermittencies that we need to deal with. And if we can couple not just uh, hydrogen, but vanadium redux flow batteries, lithium ion, even the ability of vehicle to grid. Uh, and, and in Orlando, we have a nano grid now that we are piloting all of these technologies together uh, to power an emergency operations center. So that the next time uh, we get hit with a hurricane, uh, we can really begin to look at uh, reliable uh, power that, that continues to provide emission-free electricity. Thank you very much, Chris. And you somehow also gave a first response to one of uh, the questions that came from, uh, from our panel, where one of our participants online was asking, what is the role uh, of hydrogen and other clean sources in achieving the 100% renewable energy target? So thank you already for prompting us towards that specific answer. I understand that we have Joseph back online and that he will be able to share with us a little bit more of a comment on what Kisumo is what Kizumo's vision is in accelerating the uptake of renewables. But before we do that, I wanted to get back to Rohit. I know he wanted to also share his thoughts concerning the, the, um, the messages that we heard. So Rohit, maybe you, you, you take the floor first. Yeah, well, thanks, Georgia. I just, just wanted to uh, have some uh, two more slides. I just wanted to show that um, we already are working with cities and regions, including Orlando, Kisumu, um, which, which you can see that it's a quite good, interesting spread within Global North and Global South. 
um, and, and tells you uh, when you work with them, the experience that how different it is in every region and make them uh, reach to 100% renewables. Um, and therefore these initiatives that we have on 100% renewables uh, with Eklai, uh, I, I urge and welcome all cities and regions uh, to, to join us, to commit to the energy compacts that we have. Can we go to the next slide, please? Where we see that uh, the local governments, the cities need, need to work from the very scratch collecting data to GIS modeling, figuring on the technologies, what policy works at local level, how, how to interact with the multi-level governance, with policies as nat national level, figure out roadmap, detailed implementation mechanisms, create bankable projects, and then connect to various uh, project preparation facilities, uh, uh, financial institutions, and so on. Next slide, please. To do this, we at ICLE are also trying to support uh, the local and regional governments, cities, with various activities that we can do at our end, with knowledge products, build capacity. We have just released uh, a series of case studies which features Orlando, Malmo, Vancouver, and many others. We have also come out with uh, a framework which tells how a 100% renewable energy roadmap can be built upon. Series of fact sheets on resources as well as applications have been uh, um, launched uh, during COP. Uh, we have the Transformative Actions Program, which serves as a project preparation facility, which provides further technical assistance and financial assistance to uh, local and regional governments, to project stakeholders, who can further create bankable projects and see the day of light where they can be implemented. And not to close at that, but we also uh, have the monitoring and uh, reporting at um, the CDP CLI reporting system, where we see how the progress is being made annually and then give back an analysis or, or feedback to the cities and regions uh, who are reporting that how they are progressing and perhaps what they should do uh, to make it better. We recently, as you mentioned, in the beginning launched or started the project uh, CESA, which is uh, Smart Energy Solutions in Africa, where we'll be incubating various uh, pilot projects from solar uh, rooftops to uh, mobility mini grids related in various cities of uh, in, in multiple countries of Africa, uh, where we'll be seeing how the pilots can be scaled up and replicated further to bring in this energy transition. All this, uh, you know, pilots, mini grids, solar, community energy, PPP, PPAs, they all form key elements under the transition of 100% renewables, which need to happen for nations, cities, regions to reach their ambition goals of net zero by 2050. This is where I would end and would urge cities and regions to please um, and welcome them uh, to join us um, for, for the 100% renewables. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rohit. And then I will go back to Joseph. Can you hear us now, Joseph? Yes, I can hear. Welcome back. Thank you. So we were wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about uh, Kisumo County uh, experience, of course, and in particular, tell us a little bit more about what do you feel that the role of renewable energy will be in your plan uh, to implement climate action? Yeah, thank you. In Kisumo County, as I have said, we are working towards the achievement of universal access to renewable energy, particularly which uh, energy which is uh, affordable and uh, reliable. And we are doing this through the development of uh, favorable policies. We are doing, uh, we are promoting uh, policy dialogue. We are strengthening capacities of key stakeholders and people at the grassroots. And this one we are doing through seminars, workshops and conferences. And I'm happy to say that ICLE has really supported us in this process. Through this, we are also developing uh, energy plans as mandated in our Energy Act, which is the national uh, law governing the energy sector. In Kisumu, we are also working with the uh, local communities, particularly those at the lower pyramid level of the society. We have people at that level where 80% of the household are still using unclean energy. They use wood charcoal, they use paraffin for lighting their homes, and we are working towards eliminating that. We have programs in the country, which we call Operation Nyangile Out, 
That means we are kicking out the use of those and clean energy in our household at the lower uh, level of our society. Uh, we are also developing an enabling framework to unlock the renewable energy potential and conservation measures. My department, we are carrying out energy audit in um, government institutions to encourage use of proper energy by reducing cost and promoting the use of clean energy. In Kisumu, we are also promoting the women entrepreneurs. You know, women are the majority at the grassroots and we promote them by encouraging them to, to, to do business in the energy value chain where they are dealing with solar, they're dealing with clean stuff and they are making also briquettes. This one is supporting their businesses and we also allow them, we also grant them working capital funds for supporting their businesses. Through this, the women are participating in economic development and creating employment, the majority of our women in the village. So that is what we are doing in Kisumu County, Kenya, and a lot others. Thank you very much, Joseph, for, for, for sharing with us your thoughts and also for bringing us back where we started from. This idea also of the social impact that this transition can have beyond just the energy per se side. So I think thank you very much for bringing us back. But Rana has been waiting extremely patiently. I know, Rana, you have a lot to share with us until now. And it's now your, your turn uh, to give us a little bit of your pitch. And I understand that you will be sharing with us some results. We talked about success stories here. We kind of touched upon some challenges, but you will also be sharing some of the things that didn't go as well as they could. So um, we're all looking forward to hearing from you, Rana. Thank you so much. And um, I'm very happy actually to be here. And first I thought like, hmm, being patient is uh, not my strength, but actually I think it's really good because I can pull things back together. Um, next slide, please. <laughs> Do you hear me? Yeah. So very quickly, rent one is the Renewable Energy Policy Network for the 21st century. We're a global network. It's a community of more than 2000 people. Um, from industry, governments, um, NGOs, and uh, research and academia. And I think this is something which is really important because we are speaking about a transition which is a societal transition and which is a global transition. But it's very clear, and I think this is what is super exciting to hear these great local stories. The global transition is not possible without local action and local transitions. Um, and this is why having basically this international network of local players and change makers is actually key to drive this. Next slide, please. Oh, okay, you don't have the slides, which, um, <laughs> sorry, that's now a pity because I was really going to, um, can you pull up the other presentation? Because I think there is one slide which I would really like to share here. Sorry. You're checking? Okay, anyway, so you will see a wonderful great figure later, which I think is really important to keep in mind. We're speaking about an energy transition here, which needs to happen from fossil fuel to, um, exactly, this is, um, the reality check, thank you, just in time. And I think it's really illustrative. Lots has happened in renewable energy, especially in the power sector, but this is a reality we still have on energy. And in 10 years, fossil fuel in total final energy consumption has not moved and still presents more than 80%. And this is a very important message also at the city level. And I think cities have been really pushing this a lot. It's not enough to support energy saving, efficiency and renewables. We need to ban fossil fuel and phase it out. Next slide, please. 
And this means that we need to create societal support because it is about massive transformations we are speaking about, not only of the energy system, but of the society and of the economy. And this requires, and I think we have heard it so much from all the cities, uh, city experiences here, citizen support is fundamental. And obviously renewable energy, we know that globally has a lot of support, but locally there is a pushback. And if we don't really make this as societal transition, we will not get there. So I think this is really, uh, to, to echo what has been said before, there's major opportunities for cities to engage in the transition, but globally, we really need them. And I think these are strong messages to the national governments also being here at COP to give basically the space and uh, a real voice basically to the municipal governments. Next slide, please. So Rentunon has, because of exactly those reasons, looked into what is happening globally in the Renewables and Cities Global Status Report. I will jump on the next slide already, because you'll see another reason why cities are important. We heard the left side hand figures, but on the right side, you see that lots has happened in the power transition, less in the energy transition. And the reality is we are consuming more than 80% of energy for heating, cooling, and transportation. And here, basically, policy-wise, at the national government level, it is stable no engagement, no policy intention. And cities are very close, basically. Road transportation, 80% is at the city level. Um, the building sector is here. And I think this is really something which is fundamental um, also at the city level to really see it's not only about electricity, it's really about anchoring the transition in all sectors. Next slide. And for doing this, and I think we have heard here cities that have understood the opportunity renewable presents for the urban transition. The reality is, however, that I find myself often on city panels where I'm basically cornered because I speak as a renewable person and it's seen as a, they come with their technology. It is very clear that the transformations is not only about pushing technologies and uh, for being able to also reach out to city governments, I think, and city players, it is very clear that we need to highlight exactly those things which we heard before. There are many, many drivers actually, uh, which can be um, for renewable energy, but renewable energy on the other hand also serves the urban agenda and different urban agendas. And I think that's something which we need to integrate in our different discourse because we still see that the language and the operations and the ecosystems between the city space and the energy space are still to be strengthened. I think it's still... Next slide, please. I do not only want to speak about the negative things globally, but also the positive. The reality is that 25% of the urban population is living in a city which has either renewable energy target or policy, and that is massive. Um, and um, also to echo again, because very often we hear, especially from national governments, oh yeah, that's the case in Europe and the US. But the reality is these transitions are happening in global cities everywhere in the world. And I think that is really something which is interesting to take into account because it also underlines that these agendas, renewable energy serves basically the purposes of citizens in the cities in different ways. And I think that uh, your, your um, basically, the speakers here have really il illustrated this. Next slide. Um, now, how do city governments lead by example across all sectors? Um, it's clearly scaling up renewable electricity. It's about decarbonizing the urban transport. And I think that's a link even at the city level, which can be reinforced because we see that it's about uh, creating distribution infrastructure, but it's also about creating the right regulator framework. So we still see that there is a lot of e-mobility, which is not directly, directly linked to the development of renewable power. The reality is if you develop e-mobility in South Africa and it's coal-fired power plants basically um, charging the, um, the car it's probably not the most optimal thing to, uh, to thrive for. And I think cities really have an opportunity here to create basically the regulatory frameworks at the city level for a stronger integration. It's about decarbonizing heat and, and expanding infrastructure. Next slide. And I think it's the last one. <laughs> um, 
no, it's not the last one. There is another one, but uh, cities use their regulatory power. And I think that's really something which is very encouraging because it's not only about leading by example. And what is encouraging here, please have a look at the right side. You see that they are not only looking into power, they are looking in all sectors. And I think this is really an opportunity we see in the city power to move from a power transition to an energy transition. Next slide. What are the barriers for city action? And I'll bring in, because we're here rather with a city space, I think one is that many cities worldwide don't understand themselves the key role they have to play and they can play in driving the energy transition. And that's something which is quite logical because the last hundred years, let's say, it was more the national governments responsible for the energy supply, that we are moving from energy supply to an energy demand side thinking. So there are transformations which today put cities in a key role. Plus there is renewable energy and energy efficiency, which really allow to decentralize and to have distributed generation. So I think there is a new set of play and there is a lot of awareness raising, which is uh, necessary. I think like uh, players like uh, ICLE, C40, COMSSA, et cetera, um, are playing key roles here. Um, but there is an awareness raising about the urban opportunity. There's clearly also the fact that many national governments do not give cities the opportunity to really play the role they can play. I think there's really a lot of empowerment. And in terms of empowerment, it is clearly also about access to expertise. So I think this is again where like the collaboration between cities is fundamental, but also access to finance. Let's be honest, we are speaking about massive investment that is required here. And um, I think again, we're at COP here. So I think there are very strong messages that are needed. So I think David, you had mentioned it about the hundred billion that has not uh, been uh, delivered yet in terms of um, funding. So I think there is a very strong message is cities need to be empowered to do their role. And then there's another part, which is clearly the lack of data, uh, because we need good data to inform decisions. And I know that the city networks are doing lots on uh, having good data here. We clearly see that on the energy side, uh, there is still lots of mix up between electricity and energy, energy supply and energy consumption. So there's really a clear need for improving the data situation. So uh, lots of opportunities, quite some challenges, and I think collaboration is very clearly a very important key, but also strong narratives and uh, case studies, I think, because they inspire and we need this. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Rana. We all, it was worth the wait also from our side. Thank you. Um, I, I maybe want to ask David to give a little bit of a reaction to this. So we talked about what's happening, the challenges. We talked about what is still needed to be done. Data challenge among others. What is needed for Bristol? Well, I, I thank you very much. I thought what you said was brilliant. And I thought uh, I was so inspired by what you're saying about how much is happening around the world but we do need policies policies can make a big difference uh, 15 years ago european directive 2020 uh, actually we had three percent renewables in the uk and by uh, you know 15 years later by 2020 30 percent of our renewable energy is now being supplied by renewables in the uk so directives and policy really matters and we need the right policy framework to support community energy to come forward so we can actually have local distribution i built a wind turbine that's three thousand can supply three thousand five hundred homes we've got three thousand two hundred homes i could supply all those homes but the regulatory system in the uk at the moment doesn't allow me to do that so i have to sell it for a, another ppa method which still supports the city so yeah i think um just in, in uh, there's, there's one of the things about um barriers actually i think is an international problem not just in bristol but so you just need one person who doesn't want to do what you're doing uh, and you can uh, and it's not political will it's not political will that's the problem it's, it's uh, you get caught in the wheels of of uh, of uh, municipality policy and what we really need is to streamline this for communities i'm going to be pushing for streamlining um community projects because we, we live on goodwill, but we can't do this on goodwill alone, especially our communities that are most vulnerable. And we fo should focus on the 20% most vulnerable communities in the whole world, uh, because they're the ones that are going to be affected by climate change the most. So as we're doing this transition, we need to include adaptation within that to ensure that people don't end up 
overheating in their homes, cooking. They, got, they basically uh, can't uh, escape climate change because they can't afford to escape it. People who can afford to escape climate change can move to uh, their second home uh, in the hills away from the flooding or whatever. But the people in Belgium recently, they were the people, the, the poorest that were affected by, by this. Uh, I think if we really want to involve people, we need to resource them. And that means listening to what their needs are, their inequalities are. And if we have healthy homes and healthy, we'll have a healthy planet. And that's why my thermal imaging project not only tackles fuel poverty, but also tackles climate change as well. Can I respond? Very quickly, yes. Thank you. I, I, first of all, fantastic uh, remarks. And I, I wanted to shed light on how Orlando's touching some of what Rana mentioned. One is leading by example, absolutely critical. We've seen that Orlando's commitments have now started to trickle out to businesses, to our transit authority, to our academia, who are now committing to the 100% renewable transition and doing things like uh, an energy efficiency green bond. We actually passed uh, over $17.5 million of a green bond specifically to retrofit self-perform an energy savings performance contract use those savings to pay the debt interest and have about a quarter million per year that we can reinvest. And I think that's a really interesting model. Uh, we talked about how cities lack awareness of, of driving this energy transition. And that's why um, uh, networks like ICLE and the American Cities Climate Challenge are absolutely critical. They're providing capacity and technical assistance to help us do the modeling, do the analysis around policy. Um, and then a couple of other things, lack of access to resources. There are a couple of tools we've enabled. One of them is called PACE, Property Assessed Clean Energy. It's a mechanism that allows a homeowner to get 100% finance for these types of improvements and repay creatively through property taxes on an annual basis. Uh, this this um, provides kind of a buffer from an individual versus the home actually getting the financing. We're also working with the nonprofit local community development finance institution, what's called the CDFI, that allows us to, to, to invest in low and moderate income homes uh, uh, with very low interest capital through, through creative financing. Lastly, around the lack of data. This is an actual issue for cities. And I'm happy to say that we've been working with um, companies like Google to enable data for cities around the world. They have a new tool called Environmental Insights Explorer. And in fact, we've done an analysis of our greenhouse gas emissions inventory and the data that comes out of this EIE tool. And it's nearly identical and it allows us to not spend a quarter of the year every year calculating the problem and allows us to focus more on advancing the solutions. We've also mapped every rooftop in the city in terms of its solar potential using the Project Sunroof tool. And that's now enabling our residents to better understand their opportunity to advance this community power network. So those are a couple of ways that Orlando is trying to shed light on some of these barriers mentioned by Rana. Thank you very much, Chris. I also wanted to ask for Joseph's reaction to this and what are the next steps uh, for, for your county? I'm not sure if Joseph is still connected with us while we try to find out. Unfortunately, he's not with us, okay? So um, I would like then maybe to open the floor for questions, um, asking first of all here in the, in the room, if there is any question coming from the floor. Otherwise, I understand about the inclusiveness and equity. I think it's important. And there's, there's a lot to share. Please. Thank you. Um, yeah, really interesting to hear about Orlando, Florida. And um, did I hear right that you're using property taxes to fund retrofit of homes? That is amazing. <laughs> I would, yeah, I would love to know more about that. I think that would be quite difficult to implement in UK policy, but I could see that being quite a powerful thing. And I'd be interested in the framing around how that kind of translates into social justice for, for people. Um. So the PACE program is a really creative mechanism. Um, in fact, the way that governments in the United States at least, build our communities is through a special assessment mechanism. So when we go out to build a new part of our city, uh, we take out bonds, right, that, that puts the infrastructure in, the streets and stormwater infrastructure, the wastewater piping. Uh, and, and then what happens is everybody who lives in that community, businesses and residents, pay on their property taxes, so it's called non-ad valorem, uh, to repay the bond back over time. 
And essentially what happened is they enabled the ability for this special assessment mechanism to be done not just by governments, but by individuals for their own property. And that became a game changer. So if somebody can now leverage their, their, their property um, to make resilience improvements, whether it's uh, adding new roofs or hurricane protective windows or energy efficiency or renewables, and then be able to essentially repay that through the special assessment, through that property tax mechanism over time, um, it, it does a number of things. One, it, it allows you to amortize that investment further than often loans provide. So you can stretch this payment 25 years. Uh, in addition, uh, it's favorable financing, usually between five and 7% cost of capital. And, and it really identifies kind of that savings to investment ratio, right? You wanna find a scenario where you're saving more every year than you're paying on those property taxes uh, for that assessment, for those improvements. Um, so, so those are some ways in which we're kind of thinking about how to accelerate this. And we've, in a two year period, uh, there was a third party study done by the University of South Florida that looked at um, our market. And we, we did over $18 million and about a thousand improvements in homes through this PACE mechanism. So it's, it's definitely driving in, direct and indirect economic investment. Uh, job growth have grew to about 400 jobs in the clean energy space just in that two year period, uh, just because of that policy program, right? Thank you very much. Another question? Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I just want to emphasize on one issue and then give a way forward for Kisumu County. I happen to come from Kisumu County as well, uh, where Joseph was talking from. And um, although we are in different sectors, uh, my sector is uh, environment, natural resources, and climate change. My name is Salman Orimba from Kenya. And uh, what happened for the question which you wanted to find out from Joseph, from Joseph actually, is that what is our next steps in Kisumu County on energy access that is clearly uh, uh, sustainable? And uh, I can see Joseph there. I know we have a program called uh, CCAP, Sustainable Energy Access and Climate Action Plan. And also we have the data and I think uh, as my, my friend from Orlando said, we have the data that uh, was done, the audit was done and uh, actually through the funding from European Union and the ICLE, the supported program and uh, covenant of mayors through expertise funds, we are moving towards now actualizing now what are our early actions. And actually the early actions, we have quite a number of actions. We have uh, the right documentation, we have the policy framework, we have the act, and also we are making sure that uh, we sensitize the community members at the village level. Our smallest unit at the administration is called village councils and uh, ward, from there you go to the ward, so that each and every action which has been identified from, from the village level is actually implemented in the right way and through the right framework, which is necessary. So we have to make sure that these actions are sustainable, they are achievable, and we can be able to implement them in a record time. What are our problems and challenges? Our challenges are geared towards resource, resources. So how do we get our people to have the resources? And that's why we are turning to development partners, so that we can be able to actually implement the early actions, try to reduce on, on the carbon emission and also try to use the renewable energy successfully. On the policy level, uh, as, as, we, as we are putting up the infrastructure, the policy that you must be able to look at the sustainable energy access, that is the implementation and construction using um, solar powered uh, panels, so that each and every building has a solar power installation, so that we move in that direction where if you want to boil your water, you can be able to use solar energy source, so that we avoid the issue of having charcoal, using firewood, which increases the, 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 the emission and temperature. We also have the program of um, having, having uh, to encourage the community members to walk as opposed to as opposed to driving into town so that is the the, the program of non-motorized transport 
which is being championed by the county government through the governor, so that we, as much as possible, reduce the motor driving into the, into the, into the city so that we encourage people to walk, we, we encourage people to cycle into the city. Also in place is the electric motorcycles so that we don't have Boda Boda Stuk Tuk going into the town. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. And maybe Joseph, you can also give us your thoughts briefly on the same point then. You are on mute, I'm afraid. Here you go. Yeah. Thank you, my senior. I just want to add that in Kisumu, we are combining the uptake of 100% renewable energy with business. We have a program in the county government of Kisumu where we are uh, supporting our small traders, particularly the women traders in the, in, in, in the SME sector the small and micro enterprise sector, we give the, we support them with solar lamp, which they use late in the night. And by that, that supports, supports them to, to adapt the 24 hour economy. We are promoting the usage of the 24 hour economy and the, the, the use of solar lamp support that, uh, goal in the in the support in, in in supplying these solar lamps to our traders we are also focusing household in the lower uh, level of our society the poor particularly those ones in the informal settlements and the village we supply we supply them with those uh, solar lamps which help them in their households and supporting their children in learning uh, at home where they are not connected to the national grid. So what I'm saying is that we use this, uh, uh, use, we use the support of renewable energy to support our businesses in the SME sector. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. And that actually builds nicely upon a question that comes from Josie from, uh, from online. And she's asking what is the role of the, in the, of the collaboration with the business sector in growing community energy? I don't know if anyone wants to give it a, a quick thought. We have only a few minutes, I'm afraid, so I will have to ask you to be brief. Okay, I'd quickly start, uh, we, we, we touched upon this. The reality is that uh, we do not only have a supportive governments, basically, um, that's a reality, and linking citizens' energy, community energy, to um, what is happening on the corporate side is really interesting because uh, there is an increasing um, signal from the energy consumers uh, that they want to move to renewable energy, whether it is for economic reasons, for social or environmental governance. And uh, for instance, when we are looking at the power purchase agreement, um, there was a growth from 2019 to 2020 of 10% on the public side, of 19% on the corporate side. So in terms of influencing policymakers, having the alliance with the private sector is fundamental. There are many other aspects, and I think that uh, you're going to touch upon those, but uh, from globally, I think this is an important uh, ally. Well, I just wanted to give a, a good example of how we are actively working with our Chamber of Commerce and our businesses to advance the 100% goal. In fact, last week, the city of Orlando launched a new campaign called the 100% 2030 Solar Pledge. The idea is that we encouraged businesses to uh, align with the city's overall commitment of 100% renewables by 2030 and, uh, and have them make a direct commitment immediately by joining either a community solar program or investing in rooftop solar over the course of the next 12 months. Uh, we were able to, to gather uh, our, our local football soccer team, Orlando City Soccer and Orlando Pride. Uh, we had a major boat manufacturer uh, that, that builds boats all around the country headquartered in Orlando called Correct Craft committed to that. And then a number of other governments and businesses, and, and we're going to continue to accelerate that type of pledge so that others uh, join us in this transition. Thank you very much. We are really pressed up for time, I'm afraid. So I would like to ask my colleagues to please show the results of the word cloud on the background.
And I would like to invite uh, Rohit and Michael, who are following us online, to maybe share a little bit their thoughts around the results of this word cloud. You can see the collaboration, energy efficiency, supporting policy, finance and community are really popping up as some of the most urgent and most critical aspect that our colleagues have been talking about. Oh, finance is now shifting right at the core of the entire uh, enabling system here to reach our crucial element uh, to, to reach 100% renewable. So maybe, Michael, can we start with you? What do you think about this picture? Yeah, I think, I mean, you know, it's not surprising, right? I mean, the, the, the key, the biggest words in the, in the word cloud are the ones that you would probably expect to be there. It's, it is interesting that finance seems to be sort of at the center of it, right? I, and I, I really think that we need to think generally whether that's on the on a city level, the community level, the international level, the international level. We need to think a lot more about what that really means, right? Because there is, I think, there's a sense that we need to do what is required to, you know, it's usually it's called unlock investment from the private sector. And I think that's very important. But I think in light of the fact that we are really more and more moving into a climate emergency, right? I think that's more and more broadly recognized in light of the events. I think there's a need to say, you know, we can't just sit back and say the private sector will ultimately do it for us or the markets will do it for us. I think there needs to be a much more direct and a much stronger public role. And I think that needs to be looked at in detail. What does that mean? You know, because you can't just, you know, you can't just like um, flip a switch and then there it is, right? I mean, you have to figure out how does this work? How can governments mobilize investments uh, that they themselves may undertake? How can they work with others that can mobilize more money? But how, I think most of all, it's not even a matter so much of the money alone, but a matter of who has to say in how the money is spent, right? And, and again, do we look at community projects? Do we look at corporate investments? Because the implications, I think, for communities are really very, very different depending on who, who's in the driver's seat. And I think we need to really be much more how should I say, we need to be much more diverse in terms of who really sits at the table and who has a voice. So I think I'll leave it at that maybe. Thank you. I'm sorry, again, we, we really have to close. Roy, one word from your side. I mean, I, I would second Michael and what he touched upon, but quickly energy efficiency does play an equally important role and in parallel because a lot of times the cities and regions might not have the renewable energy resource to meet their demand. That's the reason why energy efficiency measures combined with energy conservation would play a key role for us to reach the target and become net emissions as a net zero emissions. Thank you. Thank you very much. I really need to close. We have our colleagues with the following session waiting to have their tables and their panel, I'm afraid. But this proves that there is a lot of energy even going around this panel and this room to really discuss these very core and important topics. Hopefully, we will have soon the chance to have one more panel and one more opportunity to exchange. I want to thank very much our panelists and speakers online for taking part. My beautiful panel here for all of their thoughts and their faces of course, and all the audience, of course, for taking part. Thank you very much and hope to continue this conversation very soon with all of you.